Today's reading comes from Luke, the 23rd chapter. When they, when they came to the place called the Skull, there they crucified him along with the criminals, one on his right, the other on his left. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they divided up his clothing by casting lots. The people stood watching, and the rulers even sneered at him. They said, he saved others. Let him save himself, if he is the Christ of God, the chosen one. The soldiers also came up and mocked him. They offered him wine vinegar and said, if you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was even a written notice above him which read, this is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him also. Aren't you the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him. Do you not fear God, he said, since you are under the same sentence? We are punished justly, for we are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus answered him, saying, I tell you the truth. Today you will be with me in paradise. Here ends the reading. There's an old story uh, about three men who were very close friends. They grew up together, went to school together, even went off to college together. Over time, one of them became a corporate lawyer, one became a tax accountant, and a third became a Lutheran pastor. Well, their friendship continued over the years and Eventually, the lawyer and the accountant became members of the preacher's church, where their friendship just continued to grow, mainly because of their fondness for one another, their mutual respect, and their unique sense of humor. But as time went on, age caught up to them, and the pastor became very ill and was on his deathbed when he sent for his two friends. Well, the two friends arrived, and as he saw them come into the room, he said to the tax accountant, would you stand over here on the left side of my bed? And he said to the lawyer, would you stand over on the right? And they said, why? And he said, well, all my life I've tried to live like Jesus, and now I want to die like Jesus between two thieves. <laughs> <laughs> well, Barry just read our gospel lesson from Luke, and it's talking about the crucifixion. And Pastor Paul mentioned before the service that th this is Christ the King Sunday. It's the last Sunday in the church year. Next Sunday begins a new year, new church year, with the season of Advent. And for those four Sundays of Advent, we'll be anticipating and preparing for the celebration of Christ's birth when he came to earth as a little child. But we'll also be looking forward to the time when he comes back, not as a Babe in a manger, but as the King of kings and the Lord of lords and the judge of the living and the dead. Well, why, why the crucifixion? Why is that our lesson? You know, I, I, when I saw this, <laughs> I, I didn't pick this. You know, they, uh, the, uh, the gospel lessons as well as the rest of the lessons for, for every Sunday or what we call their, the lectionary, they're appointed for us. And... There's churches all over the world that are going to be preaching on this text this morning. Well, why? Why now? Why? Because it's a good day to sum up for ourselves who Jesus Christ is for each one of us personally and who is he for us as a people. Well, Jesus Christ came into this world for one purpose, and that was to be the Savior of the world. Through him and what he did on the cross, who he was, and what he did on that cross, each and every one of us who trust in him can have forgiveness and eternal life. Well, Luke's gospel doesn't really go into a lot of detail about crucifixion, but I'm going to tell you from what I've read, and if you, if you happen to see 
uh, Mel Gibson's film, The Passion of Christ, that very vivid depiction of the, of the crucifixion. It lasted about 18 minutes. Oh, it, it just hurt to watch it. Jesus being beaten. Many, many of the prisoners who, who suffered that kind of beating, they called it discouraging, wouldn't even make it to the cross. But he did. He went to the cross. He was nailed to that cross. A crown of thorns shoved on his brow, blood pouring down. I went to see that movie with my two daughters. Uh, Verna wouldn't go. My wife wouldn't go because she, she knew about that scene. And I can remember coming out of that film, and, and we were very quiet as, as everyone else was. And I got out to the parking lot, to the car, and I, I looked over at my daughter, Kate, and I said, what did you think of the movie? Before she could say anything, she just burst into tears. And the three of us just stood there for a while, trying to, trying to recoup. Well, why? <laughs> why did Jesus willingly go to a cross and die that way? Why did the Son of God become a human being to do just that? Why? Jesus came into this world. He was true God, but also true man. That means in his humanity, he suffered every strike of that whip. He suffered every nail being driven into his body and every thorn in his scalp. Why? Why? Because he suffered and died for the sin of the world. And the scripture says that each and every person, that includes you and me, have sinned. Now, you may be sitting there and saying, no, not really. I, I really haven't done anything wrong. I'm reminded of an old Peanuts cartoon, Linus. You know, that he's the little boy that would be on the floor with that toy piano playing it. Well, he stops and he looks at his hands and he said, these are magnificent hands. These hands may create incredible works of art. These hands may one day shape the course of history. These hands may one day hold the future of the world. Well, little Lucy comes by, and you know, she's, <laughs> she's the inevitable spoil sport. She looks at his hands and says, they got jelly on them. <laughs> well, my hands have more than jelly. How about yours, hmm? The Bible says not only have we all sinned and fallen short of God's expectation for us, each and every one of us is under the penalty for sin, which is death. And that's eternal damnation, eternal separation from God. But thank God, that's why Jesus came. That's why he came, so that he could be the sacrifice. He could pay the penalty for our sin, and we could have forgiveness. But it took being crucified. He was crucified between two criminals. Luke tells us there was a crowd of people there. Among those people, we know from looking at all the Gospels that his mother Mary was there. Some of the other women that loved and followed him were there. We only know that one of his disciples was there. That's John. If anyone else was there, it's not mentioned. And, but we do know that they were scared for their own lives. They probably hiding at that time. Every one of them had to be confused, disillusioned, disappointed. The thoughts had to be, we, what happened? What happened to our, our man that we thought was the Messiah? I mean, just a few days ago, he entered Jerusalem to shouts of praise, of Hosanna. Isn't he the one that preached all those wonderful sermons? Isn't he the one that performed so many miracles? Even raised Lazarus. Raised Lazarus from the dead. Lazarus only lives four miles outside of Jerusalem. We know him. It's true. What happened? Well, some are wondering what happened while some of them are mocking him. The religious leaders, they even sneered at him. They said he saved others. Let him save himself if he's... God's Messiah, the chosen one. And then the soldiers began to mock him. If you're the king of the Jews, save yourself. They offered him wine vinegar. Wine vinegar. That was a cheap drink that the, the soldiers would drink to, to ward off the cold. Now, uh, some Bible scholars believe that they weren't really offering him something to drink. They were, 
they were just teasing him, taunting him by holding it up to him. Nothing says that Jesus drank it. And while Jesus is hanging there, even one of the criminals that's being crucified with him insults him. He says, aren't you the Christ? Save yourself and us. But that other criminal, he, he rebukes that one. He says, don't you fear God since you're under the same sentence? We're, public, we're punished justly for we're getting what our deeds deserve. This man has done nothing wrong. And then he said, better yet, he prayed, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus answered him, I tell you the truth, today you will be with me in paradise. Now, how he came to believe in Jesus, we really don't know. Now, maybe, maybe at some point in his life he had heard Jesus preach. Maybe he had seen Jesus perform some of his miracles. Just maybe he came to faith because some other people told him about Jesus. Or maybe it was when Jesus was praying, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they're doing. And he offered his prayer in faith. Well, one thing is certain, my friends. God answered Jesus' prayer because he opened up the way of salvation to that believing thief and even to Jesus' murderers, all of his murderers. We look at Matthew. He tells us that the Roman centurion and soldiers who witnessed the crucifixion said, surely he was the Son of God. In the book of Acts, we read where many priests were soon converted to the Christian faith. And you know what? <laughs> you and I, you and I, since we've committed sin, we're guilty of Jesus' death too. He died for our sin. So in a sense, in a very real sense, we too are his murderers. But that's why he died, so that we could have forgiveness. We can't earn it. We can't deserve it. No more than that thief being tied and, and, and nailed to that cross could do one thing except believe. We can have a new life right now. We can have an eternal life. We can be assured of that. Furthermore, you and I, we're blessed. We're blessed because we're on the other side of the cross. We have, we have the resurrection we know that Jesus Christ not only died for our sins, but he rose from the dead. We have the Bible that tells us that there were many eyewitnesses. Over 500 people saw Jesus Christ walk on this earth after he rose from the dead. Don't let anybody tell you he didn't rise from the dead. It's a biblical and a historical fact. Hey, 500 witnesses will hold up in any court of law. He's risen. He's risen indeed. But you know what? There's still a lot of people who don't know him, either out of ignorance, out of apathy, or out of sinful pride that they simply don't want to change the way they think and more so the way that they live. That's why you and I need to hear that, the story of the crucifixion today. We need it at this time because it's up to us to help others to come to faith in Jesus Christ. That's what he's expecting of us. That's what he, he has commissioned us to do. We have the responsibility. We have the duty. We have the call. And we have the joy of sharing our faith with other people, of telling others what Christ has done for us and what he'll do for them. And that's especially important at this time of year because yeah, there's a lot of preparation going on for Christmas right now, a lot. A lot of people are putting out their lights and putting their manger scenes on their front lawns. People are writing their Christmas cards, and that's all good stuff. That's fine. That's fine. But you know what? There's other people who are mocking, mocking Jesus right now. 
There are people who are working so hard to, to prevent even the mention of the word Christmas, let, a name, let alone the name of Jesus Christ. There's those who are working to remove, to remove the manger scenes from any public place, to forbid children from singing Christmas carols in public schools. There's those that even insist that we call our tree a, a holiday tree instead of a, a Christmas tree. There's those who mock Christ and mock Christmas with their drunken parties, their lavish materialism, their foul-mouthed sacrilegious sarcasm that fills the late-night TV shows. And there will be also the quiet mocking that the perpetrators hope will go unnoticed. Just last week in California, a place called Simi Valley, a pastor went into the local Costco store to buy a Bible. When he picked it up, he noticed that the label said fiction. Now, he complained. Soon other people were complaining. And once it hit the Internet, Costco removed the labels. My friends, we have a constitutional right as Americans to express our religious faith. And we need to stand up for it, but not out of anger, not out of pride, but because we are called by Jesus Christ to share him with other people. That's why he gave his life. Jesus doesn't want anyone to be lost. And he hasn't returned yet because he's waiting for the gospel to be preached throughout the world. And that's dependent on us. And he doesn't want anyone to be lost, and that includes the mockers. That includes those that ignore him, those that defame him. And just as Jesus prayed for his murderers, we're called to pray for the lost. Just as he picked up his cross and, and carried it to Calvary, he calls us to pick up our cross. That means we too may, may suffer for our faith. Maybe it'll just be some ridicule, some nasty remarks. Maybe we'll be taken advantage of. Maybe we'll be discriminated against. And who knows, the right way things are going in this country, someday we may be persecuted for our faith. But that's what we're called to do. Jesus set an example of love for God and love for people. And he calls us to do the same thing. To love our God and, and to love our neighbor. And certainly enough to share our faith. So let's, let's go ahead with the decorations. Let's go ahead with all the festivities. But there's more important work to be done too. Not just for Christmas, but for every day. Every day. We need to continue to, to help those in need. We need to continue to care for the sick and comfort the brokenhearted. And now more than ever, we have to reach out to those who are lost. We have to forgive those that hurt us, love and pray for those that mock us. So that one day they, they too, they too may utter that prayer, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Because one day they will face Jesus. Pastor Paul mentioned the, the passing of June Hammond. Well, June died Friday. June was told seven months ago, that she had six months to live. Now, she, she certainly didn't want to die. She didn't want to leave her, her family and her friends that she loved so much, many of her friends right here in, in this church. But she was a woman of faith, and her faith sustained her. The pastors and Mary Lou, we visited. I had the, the privilege of being with June a number of times, and about a week ago, I took her Holy Communion, and she was in Franklin Square getting very, very close to, to death. As a matter of fact, she even told me, she said, Pastor Chuck, it won't be long now. So I gave her Holy Communion, and she could barely whisper the Lord's Prayer with me. Two days later, she went into Stella Maris at the hospice. I went to see her, and I was with her on Thursday again. At that time, she was conscious for only a few moments. 
But I'm absolutely certain that she heard the prayer that I offered, commending her over to her Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The reason I'm so confident is because I could see a peace on her face. There was a peace about her that the scripture calls the peace that passes all human understanding. You see, she knew who her Savior was. She knew where she would spend eternity, and she knew who she would spend eternity with. My friends, I pray that may Christ, our Savior and King, grant you and me that same peace. And may we be faithful in helping others to, go, to come to know that same peace. Amen.